Welcome everyone. We are here today to talk about integrated production system modeling or IPSM for short. Uh, it's called different things in different industries, but for the sake of today's conversation, we're going to be referring to it as IPSM. Technology has advanced people process. There's a lot of innovation happening. And so today we want to talk about the opportunities that come from that innovation as well as the technical challenges and things that we need to overcome as an industry. Promote, I'm gonna throw this one to you. We're gonna talk about solutions and opportunities, but I also wanna make sure that we touch on just how complex the problem is that IPSM addresses. So can you unpack the problem? Yeah, sure. I, I think it's important that I also give some context. I've been part of a travel industry, airline industry for 10 years. And my first job actually was to come up with an integrated recovery system. And the task I was given was when a flight gets canceled, you as a passenger needs to get rebooked, right? You need to get to a next flight. For airline, that means you need to get aircraft back, you need to get crew back on track, and then you need to rebook the passengers. The whole integration needs to work together in one model. The reason I give this example is because it's exactly the same in our production modeling systems where Ultimate goal is to have maximum production possible, but you're talking about surface and subsurface having one model together. And that doesn't happen quite often because the plants are built in silos. Integrated production system modeling allows you to model and understand the reservoir through the wells, through the production system, all the way to export. Um, that's an important thing for, in, in, for our industry um, because it allows you to both do the design um, aspects of kind of what we do, but also the production optimization aspects. Um, it integrates different disciplines together in a kind of single model. And for that to work, you need to have one comprehensive model with whole sets of physics and equations in subsurface because you just can't see subsurface, right? It's all about uncertainty management and you're making bunch of assumptions and constraints in your model and if you are not integrated back into the surface side, you could over design, you could do whole kinds of things which will cost you from a overall CapEx perspective, but also on the recovery perspective from a production standpoint. So the problem actually is very, very complex. So back to my days when I was told to say, hey, promote go design this airline integrated recovery system, it sounded very easy on the paper, but when I start designing it, it's still not solved. It's an NP hard problem. And the same applies in our energy industry. So we've got an impact on people, we've got an impact on process, and we've got an impact on technology. Uh, Justin, I, I wanna throw this one to you. You led data science and analytics globally for Chevron, and now you're focused on artificial intelligence, AI, engineering. Uh, we'll come back to that in a moment, but just wanted to know, what are your thoughts on the role that data and analytics can play in, in IPSM success or in this industry? That's a really good question. Um, I, I would I would say data is is foundational um, for the success of it. These solutions, um, wh whether they're you know first principles or you know AI ML based solutions, are are done um, in surface or subsurface. They're they're kind of built in silos, right? And so what what you know Provo just provided a, a really great example of how you integrate it within subsurface and surface. There's different time horizons in in how the business processes um, get done, and and so in in bringing data and making that visible for decision makers that's always been a challenge but without bringing data to the right people um you won't be able to make, make the right decision data has been around for a long time it's always been part of this industry what's new now from a data perspective but i would say that um technology has changed um compute has changed i mean i, I would argue that in the oil and gas industry is is when you know, we, we had we had the first version of big data, right? And and how do you how do you get that data in a state where people can process it and make the decision that they 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 need out of that data? Historically, I would say that's that's really been a challenge. Um, today, um, because of technology, you can actually simplify that data. You can prep, serve the data, so that your analysts, your engineers, um, Petrotex could actually make use of it. Um, you can better share data across functions, you know, across su subsurface, surface. You have geoscientists, reservoir engineers, you have facilities engineers, and each are dealing with different types of data. 
but now with more with with technology you can share that data better across functions now I, I would say that the the other point is technology is not necessarily the solution uh, business processes also need to be changed um, organizations are changing um, so that you can maybe not break down the silos I would say connect the silos because those silos exist for important business processes and I would say that the industry's done very 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 well for for you know over a century right and by being able to better connect these silos that'll help your business processes be able to maximize the impact that this data could have we're going to come back to data and AI uh, quite a bit in this conversation but I want to also bring in the reservoir engineer perspective. And, and Roberto, you have more than 21 years experience at Petrobras. Uh, what, is, what excites you as a reservoir engineer about IPSM and the opportunities? Uh, like to mention Libra, where I work at this moment, we are evaluating at this moment a project that's intended to produce two different reservoirs with completely different fluid compositions. And IPSM can be quite useful for to simulate the mix of those fluids in this uh, process plants in order to understand the best way to produce these two reservoirs and also to mix these fluids as well. In this case, we are not, not only looking for the, in terms of oil production in the, the project, but also looking for the lowest CO2 footprint as the project as well. That's a quite important challenge for the energy sector in this moment to reduce the CO2 footprint and IPSM can support us in this aspect as well. You're touching on a really important, uh, with carbon uh, and energy transition, that whole angle with IPSM. So Roberto, let's come back to that in a moment. Uh, I think it's important to uh, promote. IPSM is not new. It's not a new concept, um, but it hasn't really taken off. Why is now the right time for that to happen? Definitely not a new concept. IPSM has been around for a while. Now, if you think about the concept, the concept makes a lot of sense on paper, and it has been appreciated, especially with large oil producers, and also also in offshore assets. Why offshore assets? Because that's where you have the most amount of risk, you have the most amount of capex dollars going in. Your one decision, bad decision or suboptimal decision, can cost you millions and millions of dollars. The thickness of your FPSO and getting more out of what you already have is is the key over here. So, I think everybody gets it, especially people like Dave who have been chief reservoir engineer for Shell and now have a responsibility for the entire asset. But over the period of time, what has happened is that since the model is so complex, industry hasn't picked up quite a bit in terms of technology. Justin talked about silos as well. Because of that and the reliance on people, very super smart SMEs, what has happened is that it has become more of a technology challenge or a process challenge or an education challenge for this whole concept. So then it becomes like, well, Technology can't solve it, or we have the wrong people solving it, so maybe this is not the right technology or a concept that we need. We can live without it, right? And the world that we live in, in our energy industry, it's all about suboptimal uh, recovery. Look at how much recovery do we get from our assets, right? And we are okay with it. But why now things are starting to change is because we need to do more with less. This whole talk about net zero, energy transition, less exploration, more production, that means how do I get more for less? And to do that, you need to be more efficient. To be more efficient, you need to break down the silos or connect the silos, as Justin said. And to do that, you need IPSM, right? So I think now is the time where the concept makes a lot more sense. There's much more appreciation from uh, senior executives like Dave, data science from Justin, reservoir engineers like uh, Roberto coming together and saying, we need a technology and we have a technology, we have the data, we have the compute power, and now we need education across the board from top to bottom. There's a lot of layers to what you just noted there, Promote. Um, Dave, if we throw over to you for a moment, uh, can you sort of talk about some of the major challenges on implementing and specifically scaling IPSM? Uh, and maybe, you know, you have a, a, a deep water um, perspective. Maybe there's an onshore perspective because certainly they differ. So what are your thoughts on implementing and scaling IPSM? The math's quite challenging. I mean, the math's quite challenging to pull together, um, you know, subsurface uh, modeling to production system modeling and then the kind of optimization that's associated with it. Um, if I look in, in, in my theater, which is deep water, um, it's a relatively concentrated set of assets. So... 
the, the that means there's fewer decisions that you must get right. Um, and when you make decisions or design decisions on uh, pipeline sizes, number of wells, completion designs, throughputs on facilities, um, you do that in the context and background of a subsurface that has uncertainty and variability associated with it, both in terms of fluid flow, pressures, temperatures, these types of things. So having a tool that you can integrate the disciplines around to make those decisions right, um, and get those right and get those as robust as possible uh, over a range of scenarios is really, really, really quite important. If you go to an onshore context, probably, you know, small onshore, the system solutions are probably a little easier, right? But as soon as you start to scale onshore, you do end up with different pressures, temperatures, flow rates, um, and production systems are quite large. And I think the, the, the viability of IPSM is, is equally you know, valid in that context as well. Uh, Roberto, maybe a follow-up for you. If we think about the learning curve of IPSM, uh, what, why has it taken so long? Or, or do you have any perspective on what makes it so complex? Uh, the IPSM represents simultaneously the reservoir model and the production model in an integrated way. And the reservoir model is essential with the flow of oil, water, and gas in the porous media, while the production model de deals with the flow of those fluids in pipes and flow lines from the well bottle to the separation and treatment facilities. To couple these two models is a, is, would be quite difficult, it's quite complex as well. And the computer performance necessary for that can also be challenged. IPSM really opens space for, for new opportunities, but IPSM requires integrated teamwork. And it's a kind of culture change, and it demands a learning curve. It's a great opportunity to have all of the team work integrated, the well engineer, the reservoir professional, the flow assurance team, and also the production team working together. It's a great opportunity. But in order to think success with that, it's necessary, I would say, to remove silos, but maybe it's better to connect silos. Access to data is no longer a problem. The, the challenge now is that there are different streams of work. Each department has their own data layer or data standards. And when the handshake happens or the movement happens from one department to another, the model gets transformed from one to another. That's where the complexity starts to come in. And what Roberto just said, that you need to have a single version of truth, which brings all disciplines of petroleum engineering together, from a geoscientist, from a reservoir engineer, to a facility engineer, production engineer, are all looking at, at one place, single source of truth, the same version of data, and then you're making a unified decision. Because if one person is changing a constraint or a variable on the facility side, the reservoir engineer should be able to get that information as well, and then re-simulate or get a different answer. I think that's where the, uh, the technology is, is out there now to solve for that uh, particular aspect where you can start to look at single version of truth. Uh, Justin, I want to bring in the Chevron perspective and the data perspective. You spoke earlier about timelines being vastly different between surface and subsurface. Can you talk to us a little bit about the challenges that the industry has seen uh, with surface and subsurface connecting teams and technology? And do you have any thoughts maybe on how IPSM may sort of level the playing field or the rules of engagement for all stakeholders? What are, what are your takeaways or thoughts on that? It's a good question, and and I'm trying to think of like you know just you know Dave's learnings um, from a deep water perspective, and then you know my experience is more, or at least knowledge is more in the like the, the shale and tight space, and for example, in the Permian, right? In the Permian Basin, it's like it's a hamster wheel, right? It you you basically it's it's a factory. You're plugging, you're chugging, you're you're trying to understand what all is going on around you. In terms of the, the data that promote you just talked about about how like functionally um, people can share data in the same company but i would say that a, a place like um, the shale and tight asset class it i mean other operators your competitors your jv partners that are coming in you actually need to get that data too uh, because the subsurface in terms of um, what you characterized five years ago and what you think your reserves are going to be it could be different because other operators are also coming into 
the area where they think the rock is also prolific, right? And so as the wells start communicating with one another, well, the surface facilities that you designed five years ago um, has also changed, right? And so you could be um, designing a facility that's over capacity or under capacity just because you don't have enough information on all of the activity that's going on in the Permian Basin. Uh, one other challenge um, when we look across the industry and, and promote, I'm going to direct this one at you, uh, is cost. And to do IPSM, what do you say to those who think that cost of the technology or the training might be an inhibitor to IPSM? Is there another way that you can think about that? I think if you look at business case for IPSM, it hits on revenue, more recovery, more production, and it hits on not over-designing your systems or under-designing your systems. And that's your cost, right? So when you start to look at the entire profitability of IPSM, or the application of IPSM towards profitability, the business case is rock solid. Yes, absolutely, there is going to be technology spent that needs to happen. There needs to be training uh, of resources. Uh, an asset team needs to get well prepared to use the technology. You're talking about billions of dollars, at least hundreds of millions of dollars in offshore deep water assets. You're making such a large decision. It's about how do, you, how do I make sure that my resources are well trained and they're able to do their job much more efficiently. And that's where the, the, the cost really comes in, the cost of training, uh, making sure that they have access to one system that they can speak to. And getting to one system is not as simple. Uh, so, so I think from my standpoint in speaking to multiple energy executives, IPSM or solving this integration problem from a technology perspective is less of a cost center. It's really an investment of time, resources, uh, because the, the gains the NPVs of, of these projects are, are, are paying for itself. I think that it's just getting that to execution state is a more of a challenge versus a cost challenge. Before we move on to the opportunities that come with IPSM, does anyone else have any other you know, thoughts on challenges or something that we haven't touched on that is important to address? I think the value of IPSM, uh, so Justin has given a good example of the fact that uh, if you do things right, your NPV should take care of it. But in our studies, where we have talked to a bunch of customers, if your production goes up by, let's say a mid-size operator who's doing 200,000 barrels a day, and you are looking at 10 to 15% of extra production, same cost because you're doing more with less. You're not putting in more CapEx dollars into it. I think you do the math in terms of the value just on the more production coming out, the industry tends to over-design a lot. And they do over-design a lot because why do you over-design? When you can't see things, when you're uncertain about things, you pad up. And that's what happens because you can see things on the surface side, facility side, but you can't see things on subsurface side. And because of that lack of integration, you're constantly over-designing. Or sometimes when you're lacking dollars, you're under-designing. When you're under design then you're really starting all over again when the demand increases or you've been asked to produce more. So the value of IPSM, I think, can go from millions and millions of dollars uh, to the fact that you're also mitigating the risk as well as touching on profitability. The complexity of solving problems with multi-phase fluids, pressures and temperatures across in interconnected production systems is a complicated problem. And if you layer on top of that, um, things like gas lift, things like water production optimizations and different facility constraints that, that ultimately prevail in any system. Um, optimizing for maximizing production, optimizing for distribution of gas lift, optimizing for lowest produced water, it's a complicated problem that does need an integrated set of tools. Um, and that, then those tools bring the different disciplines together in an integrated fashion to really understand kind of how the system performs. One more thing I think I'll say is that why IPSM hasn't taken off? Yeah, technology, of course, has been a handicap in the past, which I think is getting solved for. But there's also, who's the right person who cares about it? We have Dave in the room today because Dave has the responsibility of the entire asset. And that includes production, that includes reservoir. 
And if you, if you don't have that senior level person who really appreciates to say, you know what, I get it. I've been a reservoir engineer before, and I know that the right integration and making sure that you're modeling in right assumptions and getting that model in place, uh, you will run into issues where you're gonna have suboptimal decision making. But you can't have that conversation with the reservoir engineer. Reservoir engineers will care about my model, my subsurface model, and hand over the plans to production side. And production engineer will care less about what's happening on the reservoir side. So the real asset manager or a VP of an asset or a SVP of an asset, I think someone who really has a stake in there to look at the entire end to end spectra is super important because the buy-in needs to start from there. Someone like Dave needs to say, you know what, I need something like IPSM. I need a technology like that. And then I need to have an asset team which is compromising of reservoir engineers and production engineers working together on one tool and making decisions accordingly. That needs to happen more and more in the industry for IPSM to take off. It's like a culture change. Yeah, that's a really great point. Somebody like Dave, um, somebody who drives a PNL yeah. that says that, hey, these are my KPI, these are my key performance metrics for each of my functions um, that work together to solve this problem, yeah. right? Because if you have you have the, if you have these siloed organizations, each with their own metrics, like, you know, we got to increase production, but we got to decrease facilities costs. We got to decrease well costs. Well, some of those kind of work against each other, right? But then overall, if your total, if your total um, kind of business units uh, or the company's PNL is about increasing return to your shareholders, you know, what what is that metric that each of your individual teams should have? Like it should be collected, right? That's a good point. Yeah, p &L, definitely. If we move into opportunities with IPSM, and Dave, I want to throw this one over to you. Uh, when IPSM is implemented successfully, what can an organization expect in terms of outcomes or wins? Maybe maybe some kind of direct examples from the deep water business that I work in. Um, we routinely build IPSM models around our, our big offshore assets. Um, and we do that such that we can make system selection choices, the big decisions, try and optimize those and ensure robustness across a range of subsurface outcomes because there's uncertainty in that. Um, when you do that, you are bringing integrated disciplines together for a discussion on what's important, what's not, what are the implications of different subsurface outcomes on um, flow line selection, throughput selection, these types of things. Um, and I think then, then you set the foundation for what's the architectural design of, of your system, right? And then, therefore, what's the cost of the system? And getting that right is, is very, very important. Um, you also, at that point, create an integrated system model, an integrated production system model, that you can keep evergreen as you move into production. And that allows you then to build optimizations or continue to run the model and optimize production as you go. And optimizing production right, is, is really the, the name of the game and when it comes to producing the barrels through the facility. Um, if you then get into a world where you say, hey, I want to pull back additional tiebacks, for example, I want to produce additional reservoirs, um, you've got an evergreen tool that's been fed with data, optimized, refined, that you can assess different pressures, fluids, temperatures of different um, you know, augmented production systems back to that original um, production system investment. So it's a, it's, a, it's a real tool of opportunity for both integrating the disciplines um, setting the system design and selection for the initial capital outlay, and then optimizing that and expanding that for future production opportunities. Uh, and Roberto, I want to come back to something you said earlier about team, I think is, is very important and to underscore here. Um, you talk about how much things are changing, and nowadays you need to see and understand problems as a team rather than as an individual. How does IPSM help with that? My experience leading with different disciplines has shown me that integration and multidisciplinary is the key for their success. IPSM work exactly with that integration, multidisciplinary team, connection. So IPSM is quite aligned with my vision. And we are looking for a team with a broad view that unlock preserves, founds new solutions, and also promotes the sustainability of the company as well. The data perspective here, um, giving teams the right data. Justin, I'm going to throw this one to you. Getting teams the right data, as Roberto talks about having a team view rather than an individual view. Um, many industries, even outside of oil and gas, 
struggle with having structured and unstructured data, which presents a bunch of technical challenges. So uh, how do you overcome that? And, and how, you know, as we move to IPSM success, what has to happen to the way data is organized? So, so first, just defining what structured and unstructured data is. So, so structured data, you can think of, you know, I guess we, we live in Excel world, so, so you can think of you know, a, a table, rows and columns, and, and numbers, right? Um, pretty well-defined, um, so structured. And there's actually semi-structured data where, where you have you know, same rows and columns, but some of the values um, might be free-form text, right? So, so still relatively structured, but we call it semi-structured data where there's, there's some unstructuredness to it. Um, just, you know, not, not rows and columns with numbers. And, and so the industry has a ton of unstructured data. Um, so, so what I mean by unstructured data is, let's say, um, emails, PowerPoints, PDFs, um, bulletins, um, images, right? And, and even audio, right? So you can, you can get audio data uh, from, from, let's say, your subsea equipment as well. So now, now in terms of getting that data um, in a useful form um, to, to allow your, your analysts, your, your engineers and data scientists to, to use it. So it's been a journey. Uh, there's been, I would say, data foundations projects being funded and lightly funded, right, for, for decades. And, and we've not really solved that problem. Um, it's, it's not super sexy to go tell a business executive like, hey, you got to fund this data foundations project and, you know, he or she might not see value from it for quite some time um, because it's, it's difficult, right? And so, so I would say that because of some of the technology changes and, and some of the techniques that people use, you know, we are starting to see a little bit of a t paradigm shift um, from um, back when people would say like, hey, let's let's structure the unstructured data uh, for the purposes of analysis, but again, that's expensive. You, you need to set teams up in order to figure out, well, what inputs and outputs do I care about? How do I structure this stuff so that um, engineers and scientists can use this data? Um, nowadays, I think that we're starting to see a little bit of an emerging trend of um, people being able to um, utilize techniques such as AI and ML to be able to um, tease out insights from these unstructured data without necessarily having to create databases for that data. Um, so, so basically be able to pull on that data uh, when you need it for different reasons. Um, because a lot of times when you, when you start to create these, these structured data warehouses and you set up projects seems to do it, a vast majority of those tables may or may not be used. Right, and so you, you wasted a ton of money, but now you know with with advances in technology and just you know um, the evolution of just massive amounts amounts of data that people had to figure out like what do I do with all this? People start to be become very creative and and you know using various techniques um, such as AI to be able to pull out some of that the, the insights from the unstructured data without having to to create these these large data teams to structure it. You talk about AI, artificial intelligence, and ML, machine learning. I am going to come back to that, but one of the things that you're touching on that I think is really interesting, uh, and I think, Dave, I'm going to uh, throw this one at you. At the core, we're talking about communication and giving people the right information. Just for industry perspective, Dave, I'm curious, some smaller energy producers may say they don't have a challenge with surface and subsurface and communication in silos. They may perceive that the way things are today are working just fine. Um, can you shed light on any of your experience? What's the depth of the opportunity here? I think there are, you know, there are many ways to model an attempt to optimize production systems, right? Um, from, you know, simple Excel files, Python scripts, integrated platforms, artificial intelligence uh, techniques. I think that the challenge is always in and the integration of the disciplines, the common data foundation, um, and then the what are you trying to achieve and get to? And of course, the complexity of the system plays in quite a bit. Um, so I suspect there are there are many outfits out there that that, ha that do a, a decent job of production system optimization from very experienced groups of staff that are that are very tightly knit that have worked on assets for a very long period of time. I suspect there's many people out there that, that have those capabilities. Um, but of course, that's not universal, 
right? And and assets change hands, people shift into different roles, departments. Um, so having foundational models that encompass the integrated production system that people can, you know, access, can use, can learn to understand, can communicate around. I think this is where your advantage is around how do you play that into um, the different asset classes that you've got. Um, Justin raises a great point earlier that makes me think about, you know, the modeling to date in the math has been very physics based. Okay, and I think we're at this intersection of the physics is maybe easier to solve because of the HPC and power of compute, but we also see the AI a revolution upon us, which says how can that potentially come in and either you know augment or synthetically learn from some of the physics-based models, um, and I think that probably provides an, an opportunity at that juncture, HPC and, and AI from from an integrated the production system modeling perspective forward. So we've got some some look ahead thoughts here uh, on the future with AI uh, and Roberto. You mentioned something I think we should should bring back into the conversation here around um, energy transition. It's absolutely part of the conversation, and carbon capture and storage CCS uh, in particular is critical for any net zero uh, pathway or journey. Um, how does or what role will IPSM play from a CCS perspective and a, a journey to net zero? In Petrobras, our projects need to be resilient. In, that needs to have a double resilience. It means that we need to have a resilience in terms of oil price scenario and also in terms of sewage emission. That should be the lowest as possible. That's why we re-inject the produced CO2 in the press-out fields. Last year, we re-injected more than 10 million tons of CO2 only in the press-out assets. And this number is increasing year by year. Naturally, the produced fluid composition you change along of that time. And IPSM is an excellent uh, tool for to simulate it in the longer run more precisely. And also uh, in the system, you can simulate the flow of those fluids in pipes and also the, the, the process plant as well. So IPSM is a quite useful tool for CCS projects. Uh, promote, uh, I have to ask as What's CMG's perspective on CCS and the role that IPSM can play? Roberto made a very good point that uh, energy transition, CCS is going to make a very big difference. If you look at it, it has the capture component, it has the storage component, and then it has the transportation component. And they all have to work together. And we've been talking about IPSM as the entire discipline where it connects the silos it uh, ensures that you're not making a suboptimal decision from subsurface to surface. It even becomes much more important to ensure that the transport lines, the pipelines that you're building in there, the facilities are, are well modeled. Because if you look at carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide is, is volatile. Carbon dioxide is going to go through different phase behavior changes depending on temperature and pressure. So can become a vapor, can become a gas. Now, how do you make sure that you are counting that temperature or pressure in your modeling from an IVSM perspective, the facilities perspective, so you are not making suboptimal decisions, whether that's pipe or causing corrosion in pipes and whatnot. So the whole essence of CCS is about making sure that you capture the carbon dioxide, you're safely transporting into your storage site and then you're effectively keeping it down forever, right? And for that, you cannot have over-designing, you cannot have some wrong assumptions being made, you'll have to calibrate all your variables in tandem for CCS to work very well together. A, a big takeaway from this conversation so far is we need multidisciplinary input, but how do you do that in an industry that has grown up in silos? There's habits formed, there's a, a deep, um, institutional muscle that just operates in one way. Do you have any thoughts on how the industry can overcome that to make IPSM successful? I think common uh, value drivers and common objectives are kind of first and foremost the key. Um, you know, the industry has grown in disciplines, reservoir engineering, production technology, well and completion, flow assurance, um, pipeline design, facilities design. Um, but common objectives around cost, production, safety, you know, greenhouse gas emissions, um, these types of things 
are the foundation of the starter conversation for what am I trying to optimize against? Um, and when you get those clear, I think you've built yourself that base and platform to have an integrated conversation amongst those disciplines around how do the different uh, deep um, expertises need to come together to solve those common goals, right? So I think that's, that's, that's really the, the foundational aspect. The tools and software that you use and the data platforms are, are very important. Um, you know, transparency, single sources of the truth, we hear this talked about a lot. That's a big deal in integrated production system modeling. Um, because then, then you do have something that you can commonly talk around and understand. Something that you can flex variables on for different subsurface conditions, uncertainties, to understand the choices that you need to make around your production system in its design phase or in its production and optimization phase. So it would probably be the, the few, the few kind of nuggets that I'd throw out around aligning and bringing together disciplines to make system choices and optimization choices around production. The, the other thing I would add to it is, um, and it goes, it goes back to what we're dealing with, we are trying to solve for net zero, exploration is expensive, and IPSM is about producing more from less, right? So that, that's why optimization now is, is required more than ever. And the second point I'll make is, what does technology help? Technology helps to scale, technology helps to automate, but technology also reduces the dependency on people. And this industry has, has great people over the years, and that's why we have done wonders in terms of what we have extracted from very, very complicated assets. But we have also had talent exit over the period of time. And when you lose talent, when you lose SMEs who have designed these wonderful spreadsheets with macros or Python scripts, you need technology. You need technology to remove that single point of success or single point of failure. And hence, I think solving IPSM through change management, through a technology and through a buy-in from the top, who's much more now involved and being aware of the PNL, which is not just about growing the top line, but also watching your profitability. That question that Chris, you asked about, you know, industry that's that's grown up and in, in, in silos and you've got experts um, in, in his or her domain, right? I would say that the, you know, the, the the experts that are leaving the industry and then kind of you, you got new new talent. I would even say that they're digital natives that are like growing up, right? With with all this technology, um, going through curriculum, you know, back when, you know, we would take tests, it's like, hey, you know, don't copy the answers from your teammates, right? Everything's on your own. You know, and you, you build like great foundational knowledge that way. Nowadays, if you go, you know, look at the curriculum in universities all around, it's about capstone projects, about teaming, and 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 you're you're being graded on like the output from an entire team rather than an individual. And you're starting to see more and more of that, um, not just within a department within a university, but now it's also interdisciplinary, right? They'll bring together, you know, the petroleum and geoscience departments with computer science, and students will work on these projects, and and there's more and more of that happening. So that as, as this workforce enters the industry, right? They're the future energy, energy industry workers um, who, who are growing up in a different culture. And, and that's the reality, right? And so, yes, they might be solving the same problems over and over again um, that, that others have solved before and have left. But I think that, you know, the, the progress that they'll make, um, you know, It'll be trial and error, and then it'll be probably less trials, less errors as, as they move on from there. So uh, Let's build on this, but also I think we should, in, we should talk about AI uh, with your role at Chevron. If we think about the talent that is modeling, trying to figure out what success looks like, um, it's also really important to know what failure looks like, and getting the right data to model the good and the bad becomes really important. And for a generation that maybe hasn't had the hands-on experience to see when things go wrong, how does AI level the playing field? Um, I, I would say that that even in our industry, I would say it's it's generally pretty conservative. You don't want stuff to fail, right? And so so we do a lot of um, proactive maintenance, right? So so that um, even when we look at the data, there's there's not as much failure data as there is normal data. And so the, the role that AI can play already is, is actually um, generate 
synthetic failure data. Um, so, so how machine what learning... does synthetic mean? Just just to be clear, yeah. Uh, what does synthetic mean, Justin? Yeah, synthetic means uh, made up, right? But, <laughs> but, but with <laughs> it's not bad. Um, so, so basically, the, the the problem is that when you're trying to build a machine learning model, um, it's built off of historical data. Um, so the idea is that if you've modeled something based off of primarily um, good, like non-failure data, and only have very little failure data, then when that model goes into production, that model will probably not perform as well when it encounters failure failure events, right? And so what you want to do is then take the few uh, failure data that you might have and use you know, additional machine learning techniques to generate um, synthetic data for these failure events. You know, there's different techniques that you can do. You can add noise to it and, and you know, change different parameters, but, but, signal, but label those data as failure data so that you have a more balanced data set so that when you build this machine learning model um, and it goes into production, it has seen the possible events of both good and the bad. So we, we seem to be in this people process technology loop uh, and culture and talent and the next generation comes up. Um, Roberto, you, you were speaking earlier uh, about the importance of thinking about talent um, and IPSM may shape or influence the culture within an organization. What are your thoughts on how culture gets shaped by IPSM? Definitely, I have mentioned a lot here about culture and when you work with APSA, multidisciplinary interactions and assets, work as part of a team, become a more intensive experience. Since the team has the same workflow, each participant become more aware of the impact of each area it has on the overall results. So in order to be the knowledge of the success that IPSM can bring to us, it's, it's important to, to really change the culture in the organizations, the energy sector as well. Uh, work in the shared model also open opportunities for innovation that will be possible to be identified in a siloed setup. IPSM established ties among multidisciplinary team members and achieving their goals and also provide confidence to the team as well. But for that, it's necessary to change the culture. That's something that's arriving in mission here. And I think, exactly, I think, Roberto, when you mention innovation and change the culture, the thing that changes the culture the most is when the team feels that they're adding an impact, right? So the, the day is when you run a model and then you wait for days, and then the production guys can take the model and run their own model. That back and forth taking long time doesn't give any kind of confidence because it's like passing on the buck to another one, right? And what happens now when you have a, one team, an asset team that has a technology, that has the computing power, that has the buy-in from the top, which means now you can do much more scenario planning. And if, let's say, your machine learning and, and AI and the IoTs of the world is giving you the real-time equipment data, facility data, you can model back into simulation, then you're getting quick answers, and then you're saying, well, what if that, what if this? And I think that's where the team starts to get much more action-oriented, and you start to see an impact. Um, I think we're gonna move to some final thoughts for this conversation. Um, some key takeaways, as you reflect on what you've heard today, uh, and Dave, we'll start with you. Our goal here is to explore the IPSM journey and making it successful. Um, and I've heard you in the past talk about this industry is one that is growing, but it's also in transition. And those are two very different things. So any final takeaways that you have on enabling success for an industry that's changing and growing at the same time? Yeah, our industry has a lot of deep technical expertise. Um, and, and we're also an industry that recognizes the requirement for integration, collaboration across disciplines. And, and, and that's really the, the, the opportunity. When you, when you link that or, or put that in the context of HPC and AI um, and, and the access to both of those technologies, and you think about production system modeling, right? And you think about coupling reservoir models to production system models to kind of export systems, um, designing and optimizing, I think there's a real opportunity uh, in that space. Roberto, we've talked a little bit about engineers who are entering the workforce now and the opportunities they will have because of IPSM. When you look back 20 years and then look ahead, 
What opportunities does the next generation have because of IPSM? 20, 20 years is a long time, isn't it? Uh, 20 years ago, the engineers were more focused in develop their own disciplines. Furthermore, the available technology was n were not as integrated as those you have nowadays. I believe that IPSM brings a great opportunity to, to train this new engineer generation from the first day there in the industry in terms of teamwork, collaboration, and take advantage of all the technologies that are available as well. I believe that the new generation will be able to develop a much, much more integrated and faster results than the, in the past. I can see a lot, uh, plenty of opportunities for the next generation, and IPSM is part of that. Justin, I'm going to throw this one to you. Do you have any final thoughts on the opportunity with that IPSM presents for those who are not technical or not data oriented? Uh, if you think about the C-suite view or from a regulatory perspective, is there any final takeaways on what all this means for those who are outside of the technical framework? I think I'd go back to the, the point of, you know, PNL, right? So I think everybody understands that. Okay, we we gotta we gotta do. We got to do more with less. Uh, we got to make sure that our return on our capital employed um, is is high, right? And so this is one of those, um, you know, through the, through the dialogue today, right? You know, everybody's kind of heard of, okay, you, you got to integrate business workflows, um, and you got to put, you got to make sure that that you get you get your uh, return on your investment, and this is one of those things that that's going to maximize your production. Um, based on um, all of these other parts that are are pretty siloed today. And, and we've talked a lot today about um, about culture change and changing mindset and getting that leadership buy-in. Um, but I'll still go back to the, the fact that the industry is evolving and it starts with people. Um, and I think we don't give enough credit to the leaders we have today that they're actually pretty knowledgeable of, of that fact. Uh, and it's, it's pretty, pretty exciting to see uh, these uh, different technologies change, different business processes change. Um, you, see, you see lots of activity in the industry going on right now. I, I feel like you know, it's very, very hard to see the improvements that you've made individually as, as companies in the last maybe two or three years. But if you were to look back a decade ago, it's vastly different, right? And so I would expect to see that a decade from now, things will be much, much better and much, much more efficient, right? But still, it's a journey, right? It never ends. So. Promote uh, some final thoughts. Any key takeaways here that you know IPSM success relies on? What are you going to walk away from this conversation as a big takeaway? I think I'll, I'll go back and give again some final thoughts about where, which kind of world we are living in. We're living in a world where we need energy, so energy security is important. It's been proven now in the last couple of years, and we need to make progress towards energy sustainability, and they both have to go together. To achieve that, we need to take advantage of technologies at hand. We need to do more with less. We need to do overall global optimization. We need to change the culture. We need to adapt technologies. The digital transformation in this industry is real. There is a buy-in from the top. It's not just a, a buzzword that machine learning and AI and fit for purpose workflows are just meant to just say those things. It's starting to get traction in the, in the, in the industry, whether that's upstream or, or downstream or midstream across the board. This industry has solved very hard problems, very hard problems. And we haven't given ourselves enough credit to that. Extracting oil from complicated assets from oil sands to Permian. I mean, these are some great revolutionary technologies that have gone in uh, to enable it. So there's no reason why this industry will not move leaps and bounds towards solving the next frontier, which is solving for energy security, reliability, and also energy transition. We have a tough challenge ahead, uh, but from my, from my perspective, from technology perspective, with the right leadership, with the right mindset, with the right change management, and a concept like IPSM, which really brings everything everything together, uh, I think we have a right path. 
on that note, I think we will wrap, promote Justin, Dave, and Roberto. Thank you everyone for sharing your thoughts. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.